One of the strange joys of history or literature is discovering unexpected connections or similarities or resonance between people from different backgrounds. This lady here, Lady Constant Slighton, was connected with the suffragettes. So are a lot of people. In that regard, she wouldn't be particularly of huge interest. There were plenty of members of the minor nobility or the gentry connected with them. However, let me read a bit of this out. Lady Constance Lighton was shy and weak and was treated kindly by the authorities when imprisoned for being a militant suffragette. Jane Wharton was poor and angry and was treated badly but with the same woman. How is that possible, you ask? Let's get to that. Constance Lighton, born in 1869, was a daughter of the Earl of Lighton. She was very private and almost certainly suffered from depression. Constance was a delicate woman with a weak heart and rheumatism. I had been more or less a chronic invalid throughout the greater part of my youth, an overmastering laziness and a fatalistic submission to events as they befell were guiding factors in existence. In 1908, she became converted to the militant suffragette campaign, and in 1909, while taking part in a deputation of the Prime Minister, this shy, quiet, sick 43-year-old was arrested with all the other suffragettes to her joy. She was sent to Bow Street as magistrate's court, refused to keep the police, and was sentenced to one month in prison. Constance seemed to almost enjoy her time behind bars. She had an interest in female prisoners, and this gave her a chance to see the system from the inside. And she liked cleaning. I was an amateur scrubber and laundry woman in the same spirit as other unemployed females dabble in watercolour as a hand embroidery. Constance was aware that she had special treatment because of her status. She had been kept in the hospital ward and treated gently. When she was arrested again, she decided to go and hunger strike. A doctor was called in, examined her and found a weak heart, so she was released. It made her furious to see how others were treated when her title helped her. And this is where Joan Wharton comes in. The altogether shameless way I had been preferred against the others made me determined to try whether they would recognise my need for exceptional favours without my name. She had cut her short hair short, she wore glasses and a cheap dress. She called herself Jane Wharton, Jane after Jean d'Arc. She joined a deputation, threw a stone, was arrested and sent to Walton Jail as a plain Jane Wharton. She announced she would go on a hunger strike. You'll notice in a minute she got rather different treatment. Two wardresses held her down. The doctor leaned on her knees. She refused to open her mouth, so a metal gog gag was forced in, breaking her teeth. It was opened very wide. The tube was shoved down her throat and into her stomach. Through, though she choked on it, the food was poured down in a constant torrent. Constance immediately threw up. The horror of it was more than I can describe. The doctor slapped her once to the cheek as they left, and Constance lay in her own vomit all night, too weak to move. This was repeated again and again and again, as it was for numerous political prisoners, which is something I'll come back to as we pop along. Eventually, Constance was rescued by her sister, who was looking for her, but she was permanently damaged by the experience and had a stroke later and died as a relatively young woman in 1923. Now, Constance Lighton, as I said at the beginning, wouldn't be of huge interest to me as just yet another member of the gentry involved in the suffragette campaign, but the fact that she ch chose to challenge class conventions and reveal that that was also um, an undercurrent within the suffragettes was of interest, but she also intersects with another wave of hunger strikers who came along a few years later, and that's the Irish hunger strikers. As I say, Lady Lighton's death reminded me of the Irish hunger strikers of a later era, or perhaps one particular wave, as there were so many waves, and they intersected and conflicted with both the British, the Irish governments, and the government of Northern Ireland. In any case, what it particularly reminded me was of Thomas Ashe, who I talked about once before. Thomas Ashe's death occurred after he was subjected to forced feeding and forced to sleep on the concrete floor of a prison cell, which is probably not too good for your health. You probably won't feel too clever after a night of that. Ash is also famous in Ireland and an iconic figure for being one of the few people to win something of a military victory during the Easter Rising and beat off a much superior force of Royal Irish Constabulary and capture a large number of vehicles. But leaving his Irish Republicanism aside, 
what was of interest was the fact that both of them showed the intersections of class and other issues with the whole issue of political struggle and how force feeding was used. Lady Lighton, of course, avoided being force fed by virtue of being a member of the nobility originally. Once it was she posed as a woman of a much lower social class, she lost that protection. Thomas Ashe, as a man, and in the heat of World War One, especially with the defence of the Realm Act in place, had no such protections. There's a whole hidden current of hunger strikers being subjected to force feeding in British history of this period, and with the suffragettes and Irish figures, which is well worth looking at and how political prisoners were treated when they resorted to tactics like hunger striking. You'll find quite a few people who ended up permanently handicapped, died, and so forth. Ash and Lightner are only two of them. In real life, they probably would have had very different political opinions, and might even have clashed on them. But they showcase how one group of people can lead you to find out about another, and how injustice from a political system can impact on people who you might disagree with on one side. Even if Lady Lighton was an ardent monarchist, the treatment meted out to her and other women via force feeding is not something that anyone should be proud of looking at the period. It's not a way to deal with a political concern, any more than the treatment meted out to Ash by force feeding was. It was a horrible process that leaves a black mark in British history, sadly.